This is Kieran, born December 17th. Ella, or maybe Bella, her parents haven't decided, due next month. And this is Matthew, all healthy, normal babies. But how each was created is anything but normal. They were all conceived with extraordinary new medical technologies. I think this is a revolutionary, evolutionary point in our history as a species. I mean, this is very much science fiction. All of a sudden, and much sooner than anybody thought, um, becoming science fact. Today, as we find ourselves on the cusp of being able to clone a human, the question is, how far will we go in our efforts to engineer a baby? It makes you feel a little bit like you're getting into territory that's really eugenics, and that's a little scary. We did not do this to create a child better looking or stronger or faster than us. We just want a baby. Tonight on Frontline, the brave new world of making babies. So we just let go of the egg. Are you happy with that egg? Very nice egg. Okay, let's fish for a sperm again. Okay, so he looks pretty good. Yeah. Okay, so let's bring him to meet the egg. This is the new act of conception, performed in a basement laboratory at the University of California in San Francisco. So here's the egg. An extraordinary new technique called ICSI, or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. I'll just bring the sperm down to the tip of the needle. A single sperm is sucked up into a thin, sharp tube and injected directly into a woman's egg. Okay, nice membrane break there. There we go. Okay, we're done. Twenty-one years after the first test tube baby, the science of reproduction has made remarkable advances in the ability to create life. Today, sperm can be frozen in vats of liquid nitrogen and chosen over the internet. So I'm just going to start by taking a good look at the ovaries. Wow, she has a lot of eggs. Women's eggs can be surgically removed and fertilized in sterile laboratories. Embryos, potential children, can be frozen and stored in metal canisters for years. Each year, more than 20,000 babies are born with the help of these new technologies. It's a booming field, creating lives that would otherwise never have existed, but also raising troubling questions. It's an amazing area of medicine, and that why. From the beginning, no one really knew if any of these techniques were going to prove to be effective or safe. So there's a grand leap of faith each time because the goal is so important, we feel like it's worth that leap. Uh, it's not just a matter of, can we do it? It's a question of, what are we doing and why? And is this good for children, ultimately? Kevin and Mina Gates wanted a baby for years. He's really spread out. It's the type you of- You do your cookies. <laughs> and I'll, I'll do, do my cookies. We've had such a wonderful five years together. We love each other a lot, and we wanted to see a union of our love, and we wanted to experience what so many people experience normally and so naturally, just, just to be able to have our own child. But the specter of having an ill child was scary. Their fears were very real. Kevin suffers from a life-threatening genetic condition called Cartagener syndrome. The lungs are uh, abnormal. Mine don't work properly, and uh, that affects the breathing, and um, a lot. Also, it's characterized by situs inversus, which means everything in Kevin's body is backwards. His heart is on the right side of his body. His appendix is on his opposite side. Everything is, is switched. A few years ago, it would have been impossible for Kevin to father a child because his condition leaves his sperm defective. But now these new medical techniques make it possible. The only problem is the baby could inherit his cartaners. They had a, essentially a lethal disease that could be passed on to a child. 
and did they want to pass that on? I knew that if, if the worst case scenario is that we have a kid with cartagenors, that's fine. So I was, I was probably much more at ease with that issue. Kevin has had a wonderful life so far. Kevin has had 45 years of relatively good health, and he has led a full life. He has played all the sports he wanted. He has married, he has gone to college. He has a very full life. He's begun businesses and, and has a good livelihood. Who is to say that we are not, even if our child did have cartagenors, she would have had a full life. You see that sperm in there? Yeah. The Gates decided to go forward, but because there were no living sperm in Kevin's ejaculate, Dr. Paul Turek had to surgically remove some from his testicle. All I wanted was one of Kevin's sperm. <laughs> That's all I wanted. Using the new ICSI technique, Kevin's sperm was injected into each of the eggs harvested from Mina. On the incubator shelf in the embryology lab, the fertilized eggs grew into 12 viable embryos. Embryologist Joe Conahan prepared two of the healthiest to put back into Mina in the hope that she would become pregnant. Then he froze the rest in a canister of liquid nitrogen. Sadly, Mina miscarried. I wouldn't want anyone to experience the, the frustration we felt trying to get pregnant and the um, emotional sense of loss that we felt. The gates are not alone. In three quarters of all in vitro fertilization attempts, the procedure fails to produce a child. Still, infertile couples will go to extraordinary lengths for the chance to become pregnant. There's mornings here at the height of the series where you walk in and the waiting room at 7 a.m. is filled with, you know, over 100 patients and we do 100 blood draws and 60 to 80 ultrasounds. It's a busy place. Angela, Melanie, and Laura. Paula Greeley is the nurse manager in the busiest fertility clinic in New York, Cornell's Center for Reproductive Medicine. In recent years, fertility clinics like this one have seen an explosion of patients seeking treatment. You feel like everyone is going through infertility. There are just hundreds and hundreds of people that I've encountered in New York. Okay. So how are you doing? Good. Good. Greeley oversees a staff of 20 that each year monitors more than 1,500 women trying to get pregnant. Infertility is definitely a, a different type of medicine than any other area that I've been exposed to. My history is uh, that I came from the operating room, and, which I thought was stressful. I used to scrub on the open heart cases, and I thought, you know, I need a change. This is stressful. I think I'll go over and work in that nice infertility office. Early in the morning, women come in for a series of tests that must be run every day for two weeks to determine when their eggs are ready to be harvested. It is a grueling regimen of doctor's appointments and powerful hormones. You feel very different from the, the medications, and so it's sometimes difficult to handle your everyday tasks. I mean, drugs like Lupron, for example, depressed me, um, made me um, basically your, your premenopausal for weeks on end. It's a very hard thing for a patient go, to go through because it's something they want more in life than anything, and it's probably something that they have the least control over. You're hoping that it works, but you also don't want to get your hopes up so that you're not too disappointed if it doesn't. It does envelop your life. It's your every thought. Um, my husband, who's very gentle and sweet, said in a very sweet way at one point, let's try to talk about something else, when for three and a half weeks this was all we talked about. And he was right. Do you have insurance coverage for any of these trials? High-tech infertility treatments usually must be paid for out of the patient's pocket because they are generally not covered by insurance. Okay, how will you be paying today? Uh, uh, visa. <laughs> the costs can range from a few thousand dollars to over a hundred thousand for multiple treatments. I felt so selfish. I felt, how can I... We're spending all this time and money and effort, and I really did feel selfish at times. But um, we did, after that first miscarriage, it was really so upsetting that I was ready to move on to adoption. 
And Kevin said, honey, why don't we try one more time? I just need to collect for your cycle today, so we're going to go ahead and take care of the fees, Elizabeth. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Did and you see the picture of my baby? Here's little Isabella. Oh, she she's so sweet. She just turned one last weekend. Yeah. Well, we only make cute babies here. Yeah. Well, Dr. Woods is the best. That's there are now more than 300 best. fertility clinics in the U.S., like this one in California, run by Dr. Samuel Wood. Well, thanks Thank again. again. Okay. We're ready. Anesthesia ready? Yes. I think there's going to be a huge revolution in fertility over the next 10 to 20 years. Virtually no couple will be unable to have a baby, except for those few that are at the extremes of reproductive life. That's four, that one's grade two plus. Outstanding. You're on today, Linda. One couple we worked with, the female partner was a backup singer in a rock band. And she was getting later in life, as I recall, she was 39 or 40, and was very concerned that she would lose the chance to have children that were hers biologically. So she chose to use a gestational surrogate in which her eggs and her husband's sperm were placed after fertilization into a surrogate. She could continue her career and yet maintain her ability to have a biological child. And what do you think of that? I think that, that couples should have a right to, to choose their method of reproduction and that unless it's outside the bounds of ethical and legal behavior, they should have the right to do that. Any height? Any specific height or weight? Nah. 6'6"? Six, six. Look, you can go all the way up to 6'6". Six, 6'6". Six. Six, six. How many guys do they have at 6'6"? Six, six? I don't know. Let me find out. <laughs> okay. We must have looked like two girls going through the personals. 5'11", 195. And a chiropractor. Chiropractor. Susan Vaughn and Deb Wasser are surfing the internet, looking for the perfect guy. I was flabbergasted that you could go on the internet and in like a minute download the entire catalog of guys, their profiles and their handwriting, and you know, all sorts of information about them. Human performance, what kind of job is that? I don't know. And is it genetic? What they're looking at are sperm donors from a sperm bank across the country in Los Angeles called the California Cryobank. You could go through on the computer screen and say, they have to be over 6'3", blonde hair, blue eyes, this has to be their religious background, and it would spit out a list of, well, here are five guys that fit those criteria. It's amazing. And this was quite puzzling to us because, of course, um, we would say, well, is it genetic? You know, what, what matters in choosing a donor sperm? And they would, uh, the California Cryobank has these questions, what, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite animal? You have no idea how many guys like wolves. You know, how many of their favorite animals were wolves? And we are going now to Dwayne Reed once again. Deb and Susan, a lesbian couple, have been together for 14 years. Last year, they decided to have a baby. We decided to carry the camera and the camera case just to, to see what it will be like to have a baby and all of its stuff. <laughs> Welcome to Dwayne Reed. Deb, a New York filmmaker, began documenting the process and agreed to share some of her footage with Frontline. Finding the sperm was a really long process. I mean, but how do you compare a person's answer who says, you know, I want to get paid obscene amounts of money for doing what I love to a person who says, I want to be involved with and possibly leading a political nonprofit group that pursues justice for the powerless people in the U.S. The Cryobank provides 26-page profiles of each donor with descriptions and medical histories. You can even order audio tapes of the men. I am six feet one. My hair is blonde and my eyes are blue. I have a large bone structure and a lean build. My mother is very rigid. I don't like it when people don't listen to me. We'd go down these lists and we had so many of them and there was the wolf man and the bat man and the pop tart man and the pink and green man, you know, as we would try to remember them by their <laughs> color food or... Um, and you wonder why is it important? Um, and the answer I, I finally felt was that, to use a, an example, if, if a man says, you know, 
my favorite food is, you know, Italian and Chinese cuisine versus the guy who says, you know, my favorite food is mom's mashed potatoes with extra gravy and pop tarts, put them in the <laughs> microwave, heat them up, yum, you know, it's, I like that guy. I like the guy who's specific, imaginative, descriptive, if that's genetic. It makes you feel a little bit like you're getting into territory that's really eugenics. And that's a little scary. You start thinking, well, you know, taller people have, you know, life is easier for them, or, you know, this or that kind of um, hair people tend to like, or, you know, you start thinking in a way that's really kind of um, not the way I would have wanted to be thinking about it, but it's very hard to avoid. I remember another guy that we really, really liked, they asked him, what is your ambition? Where will you be in 20 years? And he said, he was a music and a philosophy major, and he said, I want, in 20 years, I want to be making music that makes quadriplegics dance and bricks cry. Could be genius, could be nuts, you know? I mean, <laughs> how do you assess this stuff? You know, how do you look at these papers? I mean, it was quite a hard decision. At the California Cryobank, sperm is analyzed, processed, and frozen for at least six months. Potential sperm donors are screened for genetic disease and low sperm count. Those accepted come in twice a week and are paid up to $50 a time. We now know the ideal man. He's six feet tall. He has blue or green eyes. He has blonde or brown hair, median complexion, college graduate, and has dimples. The laboratory prides itself on providing customers with all the information they want, except for one key thing. All sperm donors are anonymous, and there are no pictures. Hi, it's Latrice. That's where Latrice Allen comes in. She's the cryobank's donor matching counselor. For $40 a half hour, Latrice will guide a client through the selection process. Your husband's lips are small, medium, I'd say medium, and the donor has a thin upper lip, but a medium lower lip. Some people say that, you know, how does it feel to play God? And I, I'm definitely not anywhere near playing God. I'm just one of his helpers. Would I date him? Sure. Not everyone wants to match yes, a husband's looks. The cryobank good. estimates that 40% of its clients yes, are single women. They'll either send a photograph in of a brother or a father, or sometimes they'll send in clippings from magazines of popular actors. It seems like whoever's in the limelight at that particular time. Long legs? Well, I don't know if the donor has long legs or not. <laughs> like when Titanic came out and Leonardo DiCaprio was the, the popular thing going, everyone, well not everyone, but the clients who were in that category would call in and say, I want someone who looks like Leonardo DiCaprio. I think he'd be a pretty good-looking model. <laughs> Even at a Los Angeles sperm bank, not all the donors look like movie stars. So Latrice and a committee of women from the office have developed a way of rating the men. And he's an eight in attractiveness on our attractiveness scale. The highest we've given so far is an 8.5. I don't think we'll ever give higher than an 8.5. We're pretty critical with, with uh, dissecting their facial features, so to speak. <laughs> You're tough. <laughs> That's probably why I'm still single. You can take that off there. <laughs> I really hate, is the camera off now? I hate no, it's the, not. Whole, the whole thing, the whole physical thing. I, I, can't, it's very, I, I really don't like it. Why? Because I don't, I don't think we're, we use much of a, um, a um, it's not the scientific approach, you know. It's so subjective. It's so subjective. Okay, and this donor, so which donor did you want to ask about? Okay, hold Marilyn on. Marilyn Ray also counsels clients at the cryobank, but on the genetic history of the donors, she says that the clients are often overwhelmed. I spend a lot of time explaining to patients that no one can separate out nature versus nurture, and we certainly haven't. Um, we cannot say how much... Uh, nature or genetics contributes to intelligence and how much the environment the child grows up in contributes or the schools or the society. But I do remind patients that the patient, the mother, 
the recipient will be contributing half of the genetics. The more we learn about genetics, however, the more we are surprised by how important genes are. When we put a mouse into the middle of this apparatus, the mouse has a choice. The mouse can walk out on this open plank and look over the edge, or the mouse can go into this enclosed area where it's nice and safe. Lee Silver is a professor of genetics at Princeton University. In this experiment, he is testing mice for genes that make them more prone to take risks. Looks right over the edge, this guy has no fear, just sort of walks out over the plank. So these mice, these, these B6 mice, have uh, genes that predispose them towards risk-taking behavior, what we call novelty-seeking. He has no interest in going inside the enclosure. Why don't we put a mouse in now who is predisposed towards uh, avoiding risk? And this mouse is uh, much more likely to just go back in the corner, the safe spot. So this animal realizes that uh, the walls are protecting it and basically spending almost all of his time inside the uh, enclosed arm. I mean, this is the most amazing thing, is that, uh, you know, this guy has different genes, and if you look very carefully, you can see there's a clear difference that we can measure between the way he behaves and the way that the black six mouse behaves. It doesn't matter how you raise them, it doesn't matter if you foster them, between parents, the genes determine that the black six mouse is going to be more curious, more likely to go out on an open plank 100 feet above the ground, and the DBA mouse is going to spend most of its time in the enclosure. And here we have our 123 donors, and this is the first 25 coming up now. We had an enormous chart of all of these guys to, to try to keep them straight. And also because you had to make sure that the guys were in stock, you know. So you had to sort of constantly update it. And we liked this guy in, in August. Was he still available in September? So One bank that we looked at, they had, you know, a guitar-playing lawyer who was very popular, and he sold out at the beginning of the month every month. So <laughs> if you want him, you better know that, and you better call them, like, early in the day on the first of the month. I have a lot of clients that say if I don't laugh about it, it would just drive me completely crazy. You know, because they're making a decision that's going to affect them the rest of their lives. I mean, we have a pretty good, you know, procedure here, but we don't have a return policy like Nordstrom's do. Once you have a child, you can't bring him back and say, I want a refund. Uh, at the last moment, we really had to make a decision because we uh, it's timed so that uh, we were down to the wire. We had to have that sperm FedEx overnight because I was ready. And, uh, and then suddenly it became terribly serious because, because this is going to be a person who's a real part of your life. And what are you making your choices about? You know, and suddenly it was sort of frightening how much we'd laughed throughout the whole time. And we really had to decide. I would actually conceive and lose the pregnancy in a month. Maybe your numbers are low because you have some type of an obstruction. I just tried acupuncture for the first time. For infertility? Yeah. Uh -huh. Infertility is a big business. This is probably the largest conference I think that's ever been held for patients who are experiencing infertility. Here in a vast New York convention hotel, couples can shop for the latest in infertility treatment. We've been trying to have a child ourselves and going to our doctor, but we want to know about donor eggs and we want to know what's involved. Um, you know, so we've come here to get more information. We've been going through fertility treatments for the last about three years, mm -hmm. more or less. Uh, we just had one un unsuccessful IVF cycle uh, very recently last year. The regular Lupron kit comes, this is it. Each year in the U.S., 1.2 million people seek some type of treatment for infertility spending up to two billion dollars. And we provide pictures of sperm donors too. Nobody else is doing that. With little insurance coverage, couples must fend for themselves in a booming for-profit market. We took the second mortgage on our house to do this. So, uh, and we were fortunate that we had a home. Well, if I can help you with regard to any medications, questions, insurance, costs, availability, don't hesitate to call me. Okay. We ship anywhere. The whole world of assisted reproduction has been described, I think, aptly as kind of the Wild West, kind of mated with uh, American commerce and modern marketing. 
and what you see is uh, a number of very highly successful clinics viciously competing for patients. This tells you a little bit about the St. Barnabas healthcare system. So you have a variety of uh, highly professional individuals pitching their wares, their success rates, their new technology, their cutting edge technology to this uh, highly susceptible group of infertile couples who uh, are almost willing to try anything and almost pay any price to get a baby. George Annis sits on the ethics board of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. He says that this highly competitive area of medicine is notable for its lack of regulation. The industry has consistently resisted regulation. The argument of the industry is public policy should have nothing to do with this. This is a private decision between infertile couples and their physicians to do whatever the physician can help them do to have a baby. She actually may need to go up to 20. Prematurity is one of the biggest health risks for babies, and carrying more than one baby greatly increases that risk. Anna says the lack of regulation has led to a high number of multiple births, the direct result of doctors implanting too many embryos in an effort to get their patients pregnant. I mean, there's just no excuse for any inf infertility specialist to ever be involved in a large number of multiple pregnancies. Their excuse is, well, that's what the couple wanted. We were just giving them babies. That's no excuse. Chris and Michelle Whitcomb never expected serious medical problems when they underwent infertility treatments. Last February, their twin girls were born three months early, weighing just over one and a half pounds each. The fears are endless. The day-to-day, -day, the constant worrying. It's a roller coaster ride. They did wonderful for six days, and now they kind of crashed and burned, both of them at the same time today. The fight or flight reaction in your body is basically flipped on constantly, nonstop. You did that. Look at your little diaper, you poor thing. The babies were fighting for their lives in the newborn intensive care unit at California Pacific Medical Center. Well, it's just, you know, whether or not they're going to, you know, make it. I mean, that's, you whether know. Whether they're going to live or die, what the consequences are later, you know what I mean? That's a whole other issue. They you got to kind of live in the moment, though. You kind of have to take everything day by day. Michelle became pregnant through in vitro fertilization at one of the most popular clinics in California. At first, she conceived triplets, but with her doctors, decided to abort one fetus in the hope of saving the other two. This has become a common practice. You know, the novelty of having multiple, you know, births sounds really great, but the, you know, the risks associated with it and the difficulty it takes to actually get through it, it's not for the average person. The need and the pain that you have when you have infertility is such that you just tend to filter out all the bad news. The only news you want to hear is, yes, we are pregnant. You get a big packet at the infertility clinic of all the drugs and all of the, the everything. You don't get one piece of information about premature babies and multiples. I don't remember getting anything. Well, you get, you get stuff about the risk of multiple pregnancy, but I don't think oh. you really get the, the full gravity of what that means. Look at you move your little legs. The problems are a whole host of issues cerebral palsy, mental retardation, blindness, very significant handicaps at certain gestational ages which are just uh, uh, haunting you for the rest of this uh, child's life. Dr. Michael Katz, the Whitcomb's obstetrician, thinks society is not addressing some of the hidden costs of infertility treatments. He estimates the intensive care for the Whitcomb preemies, for example, could be nearly a half million dollars. The question is not whether those who were born through infertility deserve to be born and live life. That's not the question at all. The question is, where do we want to put the emphasis into society? Do we want to take the resources, limited that we have, put it into infertility treatment with a multifetal gestation? Or do we want to put it into prenatal care for large numbers of women who get no prenatal care? In many leading fertility clinics, nearly 50% of all in vitro treatments of women under 35 result in multiple births, like the Whitcomb twins. 
maybe the infertility doctors would consider that we achieved pregnancy, we achieved a delivery, and maybe we'll have babies here. So that, you know, in their statistics, it's considered a successful infertility therapy. For me, it was considered, you know, the worst outcome possible because 25 weekers or 24 weekers face tremendous odds against them. And I'm, I'm very worried, and I'll be worried until the day go, they go home, and, and, and that'll be a few months from now, and that's the good outcome. And the bad outcome is, of course, uh, if they are going to be handicapped or, or will not make it. You know, it's just hard. I wish everybody could just remember the responsibility of any pregnancy. Any pregnancy, I mean, it's, you know, 